Thanks very much. And now our second speaker for this section, uh, Kenneth Sharp, Professor, Department of Political Science at Swarthmore College, designing for patient-centered care when there is no cure. I'm particularly interested in this because I think for most diseases there is no cure, and cure is usually hype, so we look very much forward to your, to your presentation. Thanks, Larry, for inviting me, and to Carissa and Denise and Zoe and Roger for this spectacular organization you've done to get us all here and keep us fed. And I'd like to also thank the John Templeton Foundation that's helped pay for my sabbatical research from Swarthmore so I could do the preliminary research that I'm going to talk to you about today. Claire Allen was a small, straw-haired librarian in her 40s with breast cancer. She was married with two young children. Oncologist Jerome Grootman, when he was a very young doctor, remembers his discussion with her. We met in my clinic and she looked at me expectantly. Claire, with this disease, a remission would ordinarily last three to six months. A person could expect to survive between one and two years, I told her bluntly. She appeared to take the news stalwartly, but I later learned from her husband that she had left the appointment deeply shaken. She told her children that she had only one Christmas left to live. Her face was full of despair whenever I saw her. And yet Claire lived for nearly four more years. She was able to travel, work part-time, take care of her children, but was unable to stop thinking that at any moment she would die. Chastened, says Grootman, I tried a different approach with Harry Gold, a short order cook in his 60s who had acute leukemia that had resisted all treatment. At one point, Harry asked me what else could be done. I reassured him that there were drugs that had not yet been tried, even though I knew they were unlikely to help. When Henry, I'm sorry, it's Henry. When Henry started to bleed around his lungs, I had the interns draining the hemorrhage with chest tubes. I insisted he be intubated, supported on a respirator in the ICU, and given numerous blood transfusions. I never asked Henry what he wanted. He stayed alive for more than a week on the respirator, a catheter in his heart, tubes in his throat, unable to speak to family and friends who had come to his bedside. Now, Jerome Grootman is a much wiser doctor today, but he then lacked both the moral skills and the habits to wisely care for patients who could not be cured. In his nine years of medical training in the 1970s, he was never, never shown how to speak about dying to a gravely ill person. In a 2002 study, that audio taped oncologists who were dealing with patients. The study found that 25% didn't even tell their patients that their disease was incurable, and 90% didn't even ask their patients if they understood the information that the oncologist was giving. Now, walk with me for a moment into the palliative care consult room in the outpatient clinic of Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center, which is associated with Dartmouth College on the Vermont, New Hampshire border in the Upper Valley, it's called, of uh, New Hampshire. Dr. Max Virgo is meeting with Arnold and his wife. Arnold has ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. Arnold is not facing imminent death. In fact, his deterioration has slowed, but it will continue. But every few months, Dr. Virgo has Arnold check in with him. Virgo's establishing the kind of trust he'll need to care for Arnold and his family when things get worse. The good bonds make for easy banter and serious work. How's your grandchild doing, Max asks. How's your, your, your daughter reacting and your granddaughter reacting to the illness? Can I help set up some sessions for your daughter with counselors? That might help her learn to talk with her child. You know, unanswered questions 
might be scarier than the truth. And it's tough to know what's appropriate for a particular age. How are you, he turns to Arnold and his wife, how are you both doing with chores around the house? Tell me more about the sensitivity you're feeling in your foot. Well, I'll talk to your doctor and see if it's the medication and what we can do about it. Are there other things on your mind, worries about what the future is going to be that are worth talking about? Arnold's wife says, just that this isn't the way life's supposed to go. But I try not to think about this too much. Max asks, you think there's a bigger purpose to any of the things that's happening? You guys have a spiritual faith or belief in a higher power? No, says Arnold's wife. We used to argue over little things, though, but we don't anymore. Now, Dr. Virgo doesn't do this kind of work alone. He's part of a palliative care team. And earlier that morning, in the morning huddle, which takes place every morning at Dartmouth-Hitchcock in the palliative care service, he's sitting around a table. And at that table are two other doctors, two nurse practitioners, a social worker, a chaplain, the head of the volunteers, and often a pharmacist. After opening the meeting, as they do every day, with a poetry reading, each person takes a turn uh, doing that. The team spends an hour going through each of that day the 27 inpatients and outpatients that they're responsible for. What's happened in the last 24 hours, they ask. Are the pain meds working? Mm, it's her nine-year-old grandson that's giving her something to live for. What can we do for this patient's spouse who doesn't have enough money to drive her to the hospital? For this patient who's stressed out at not being able to feed her kids? Palliative care like that was rare when Groupman first started practicing. It grew out of the hospice movement in the 70s and 80s. Both were countercultural movements. Both faced uphill battles to establish themselves. But why the resistance to such great and relatively inexpensive care? Well, one obstacle was the bureaucracy of specialization, right? Experts who treated fragments of humans couldn't see the whole human being in their illness. Another obstacle, of course, is the economic model, since reimbursement systems made it more profitable to favor life-prolonging interventions than listening, than talking, and then pain-reducing medications. And a third obstacle was an inhospitable hospital culture. In the reigning medical paradigm, the aim was cure. Hospice was coded as failure, the nothing more can be done option. The place where you outsource a patient for the last few days of his or her life. The palliative care paradigm challenged that view. Dying was not always a medical failure, said the paradigm. It was an inevitable part of life. It was actually part of medicine. There's no defining moment, said the palliative care people, when the end of life care suddenly begins. So palliative care should begin at the very moment a life-threatening illness is diagnosed, hand in hand with treatment aimed at cure or remission. Palliative care challenged other elements of the reigning culture. It said, don't just focus on the individual patient. You have to focus on the family and caregivers, too. Don't just focus on medical outcome. The very process of helping patients and families adjust to dying is part of the outcome. So here's the puzzle I've been working on. How did palliative care break through these cultural and institutional obstacles and get a foothold in a major hospital like Dartmouth-Hitchcock? by today and many others too. So imagine you're sitting at a strategic planning session in the 80s before any of this happens. And your mission is to overcome not the resistance of a bug, but the resistance to palliative care and get it into the medical system. What would be some plausible strategies? My guess is, given the brain power in this room, the first thing most of you would say is, let's get a foundation to give us some money. Well, that's a great idea. So let's stipulate that you've got some money. But that then leaves open the question, what will you use that money to finance? Well, here's some possibilities that I'm guessing 
would come out if we could have a longer discussion and if we were sitting in the 1980s. You could say, how about using the grant money to educate patients about their choices? Or how about a strategy of directly educating the doctors? Teach them how to talk about death. Train them in communication skills. Show them better ways to alleviate pain. Or a third strategy might be institutional redesign. Reorganize hospitals to provide palliative care. Break down the fragmentation and specialization that insulate the very sick from care. Change the incentive structure to stop prioritizing ever more tests and procedures. And a fourth strategy might be, let's change the culture. How do you do that? In this room, my guess is people would say, do the research, right? If palliative care reduces pain and suffering, if it allows more patients to choose their end of life care, we'll have evidence to change the culture and we'll convince the skeptics. I'm sure you could come up with more ideas, but let's play with these. So the strategy of inform the patient to improve care made such good sense that in 1985, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation put $29 million behind a 10-year project to do exactly that. The acronym of that project was the Support Project. And what the researchers did was first document patient preferences and showed that they had little impact on care and docs generally didn't even know them. They documented the fact that high levels of relievable pain were common even among actively dying patients. And then they designed an intervention. Skilled nurses would give patients information on their prognosis and how likely they would survive six months. They informed the patients of their choices. They put patient preferences right in the doctor's charts for the doctors to see. The prediction was this intervention would bring a decrease in patient pain, more patients would be enabled to die at home, there would be, which was a strong patient preference, there would be a decrease in the time they spent in undesirable states, like on a ventilator or in a coma, there'd be an increase in doctor's understanding of patient preferences, and an increase in orders against resuscitation, DNRs. So nationally, this support study had a huge impact. It unleashed a wave of media criticism about the bad care that physicians were giving to dying patients. But the inform the patient strategy itself failed dramatically. It had no impact on the care processes, no impact on patient outcomes, no impact on costs. For example, where a patient died at home or in the hospital wasn't determined by preferences, but by the availability of hospital beds. The patients and doctors only rarely discussed patient preferences. And when patients did have advanced directives, they had no measurable impact on the care that was actually given. I talked with Joanne Lin, a medical doctor who was one of the principal investigators in the support study. And reflecting back on the results, Lin told me, you know, I didn't think it would create nirvana, but I didn't think it would have no effect. It was hard for people to swallow. The assumption was if you tell patients what they're up against, then all will be well. Then the great hand of God came down and ironed this study flat. That was 10 years work that she put into that study. But why didn't the inform the patient strategy work? A useful way that Lynn put it to me was this. The glide path was more important than the decision making. The glide path was like a cultural and institutional default, which pulled patients toward ever more treatments. The doctors, like their patients, were reluctant to talk about dying or didn't know how. The default presumption was, never give up hope. We'll try everything we can. And the presumption was, if you die, I failed as a doctor. Other factors shaped the glide path. It was often hard to take a patient home even if that were their preference. And in a fee-for-service system, unending tests and treatments were profitable. So informing the patient created an illusion that there was real decision-making going on, right? An illusion of patient autonomy, patient choice, patient-centered care. But the whole way the popular culture and the medical culture and the hospital system framed care at the end of life overwhelmed the inform the patient strategy. What about the second strategy for change? 
let's better educate docs and nurses in palliative care. Well, that seems like a no-brainer, right? Build palliative care into medical education, and it'll become part of medical practice. And that's what a handful of docs at Dartmouth started to do in the 1990s. They were already interested in palliative care there in the late 80s, but they were further energized by the arrival for a few years of Joanne Lynn from the support study and one of uh, the other support studies heavyweights, a woman named Joan, Dr. Joan Tenno. Their mentoring and the prestige and buzz around the support project encouraged creative experimentation by some of the docs in the medical school there. There was no field of palliative care, so the doctor teachers did a kind of bricolage. They pulled from the field of pain management, from geriatrics, from hospice. For example, Dr. Sarah Goodland, a geriatrician and a few of her colleagues, began inventing medical school classes to teach the rudiments of palliative care. They did role playing so med students could practice giving bad news. They organized volunteer work and observation in the local hospice. They invented a train the trainers class to teach faculty how to have conversations with patients and then how to teach this to their students. Oncologist Joe O'Donnell teamed up with the local hospice director, Marie Kern, in 1996 to create a full day seminar for third year students entitled Living with Mortality, a Medical, Moral, and Spiritual Examination. But there's a puzzle here. If the field of palliative care didn't exist in the 1980s and 1990s, how did these educators themselves get educated? Take Joanna Lynn, for example. She trained in geriatrics at Boston University. She cut her teeth doing hospice work in underfunded nursing homes in Washington, DC. She said, often these were the worst kinds of places. We were used to making do with nothing. Doctors in a hospital could slap on an IV, ask a pharmacist to mix something else up, have a consultant down the hall stop by and see a patient, and maybe even have lunch. People in my line of work had none of that. And most of the docs and nurses in hospice had no authority. If I ended up in court for the narcotics I administered, and she had been called in a couple of times by the Washington DA, doctors wouldn't have supported me. But working in the trenches was exactly what educated Joanne Lynn about the end of life care. It was what prepared her to co-direct the support study, to become a teacher and a mentor of others, and later a national champion for the care of the frail and elderly. Or take Joe O'Donnell. He was an early advocate of palliative care. He said, I was trained as an oncologist. I worked at the VA hospital near Dartmouth. He actually became the chief of oncology there. A few of us oncologists around the country realized how bad the end of life care was. We were a fringe group. We would meet at conventions, go out afterwards for a drink, and we talked about the fact that cancer patients died. Now, this may seem obvious to you, he says to me. This may seem obvious to you, but it was not talked about by oncologists. For most oncologists, the thought was, if only they'd lived another month, we would have discovered the cure. Joe and a friend wrote an article called View from the Fringe. We said that if you ask oncologists what they do, the standard answer is, we give chemotherapy. We argued, we don't just give chemotherapy. Today, O'Donnell, in his early 70s, is at the Center of Medical School Efforts at Dartmouth to teach compassionate care. He's a role model for many students and other docs, but he first educated himself about palliative care in the 80s because he saw the need and no one else was doing it. Or take Marie Bakaitis. As a young nurse in the cancer wards, she was told, don't give patients opioids unless they really have pain. You don't want to create an addiction or feed one. Bakaitis says, denying them an opioid because it might be addictive? I can't go back and repair the harm I may have caused those patients, said Bakaitis, but now I do all that I can to make it better for my patients. With these efforts comes some sense of absolution. Bakaitis' specific interest had been in pharmacology and physiology of bone marrow transplants. That's what motivated me, she said. But when you start talking to patients, the ones that don't make it and the ones that do, you realize there are more important things in pharmacology and physiology. I remember a story she said in Time magazine. 
we are curing cancer. But no one was talking about the people who were not cured, which is the majority. This fueled indignant feelings, outrage in me. I felt we needed to give these people a voice. So in the early 1990s, shortly after she started work at Dartmouth, she learned pain management and research skills from a psychologist, a Dr. Tim Ailes. She teamed up pe with people like Joanne Lynn and with uh, Sarah Goodland and Joe O'Donnell to learn palliative care skills. And by the late 1990s, she became a central actor, as we'll see in the reform effort. So the education of the educators was important, but the classroom was in the school of hard knocks. It was learning in spite of the system and not because of it. It was learning through trial and error. And above all, it was learning from the stories and suffering and aspirations of the patients and their families. So these pioneers struggled to find ways to expand education. And because there was no official field of palliative care, no practice of palliative care in the hospital, the med students and the residents could not learn by doing. They spent a decade, most of the late 80s and 90s, trying to establish a palliative care service at the hospital. And that effort, actually three distinct efforts, foundered. Then in 1997, they gained a toehold by making common cause with the end-of-life activists in the hospice movement, people like Marie Kern. So in December 1995, Marie Kern's opinion piece appears in the local Valley News. We have so gritted our teeth against the end of life, she wrote, that we fail to live it. She's head of hospice in the area at that point. In our denial and fear, we ourselves miss the opportunity for a peaceful and pain-free transition from this life to what's ever next. But the support study, she went on to say, showed that we're not going to have this opportunity by simply informing the patient. Why? Because too many doctors, quote, are reluctant to let a patient die because they see death as a personal failure. And also, she said, because their expertise fosters the illusion that one need never die, at least not this time. The title of her piece was, Doctors Will Improve End-of-Life Care Only When We Demand It. So Kern was not a doctor. She was not a nurse. She's an educator, a community organizer. She was a Brown graduate who used to teach courses in uh, personal growth and development. She explains that her life took a turn one day, she remembers sitting on a hill in Pomfret, Vermont, reading Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's very powerful book, 1969 book called On Death and Dying. Uh, it was a book that helped energize the hospice movement. So Kern writes to Kubler-Ross. Kubler-Ross says, I'm coming to New Haven to give a talk. Come on down. Let's have a cup of coffee. They met. That brought Kern into contact with people like Kubler-Ross, people like Dame Cicely Saunders, the a uh, nurse who became a doctor in England who founded the first major modern hospice, St. Christopher's. And in the early 1980s, Kern moved into action. She created a local hospice program first in Peterborough, uh, New Hampshire with volunteers. She was then hired in the Upper Valley area around Dartmouth um, uh, to head the hospice. And Kern's position was that she didn't want hospice to simply be a last ditch choice for patients. People afraid of dying, said Kern, see it as a time of giving up. They see hospice as the death knell. The point is to help people earlier in their experience to feel in charge of their treatment choices, in charge of where they want to be. But that meant getting to patients early in their diagnosis, and that meant getting hospice care into the hospital, not something that was outsourced in the last few days of life. So Kern joins forces with the palliative care advocates at Dartmouth. She teaches courses with them. She gets to know them. Um, but the getting palliative care established in the hospital is still elusive. The advocates at Dartmouth begin to push for it in late 19, about 88 and 89. O'Donnell says, we put in proposals, we created budgets, but there was little interest in the administration or in the docs. People would say, we don't want Dartmouth-Hitchcock to be known as a place where people come to die. We want them to think of us as a place where they come to get better. Officially, the hospital leadership said, nice ideas, folks, but we don't have the money. The advocates kept pressing forward. They designed the courses. They did the research. Uh, they got major research grants. 
By 1997, said Marie Bakaitis, the perfect storm for change is brewing. There are initiatives at the med school and the hospital. O'Donnell is teaching with Kern on death and dying. The studies we did, the focus groups, gave us this incredibly rich data. She says it was becoming a local, regional, and national scandal that you have people in the hospital and you're torturing them. But how to get the hospital leadership to commit? That's when Marie Kern decided to pay a visit to Dorothy Byrne, a local philanthropist. Kern's immediate need was a mere $20,000, which she wanted to use so she could pay the doctors who were then volunteering in hospice a little something. But she hinted in this visit to Byrne that she had a larger vision. Byrne was curious. Kern spelled out the idea of a palliative care service at the hospital. How much would you need for that, asked Dorothy Byrne. Oh, about two million, said Marie. I'd like to finance that bigger version, said Byrne. So, Kern then pitches the idea to Bob Greenberg, who's the head of the cancer center at Dartmouth. He's already sympathetic to the idea, and he thought he could make an economic case to the leadership, because the data showed that palliative care increased patient satisfaction, and that would give the cancer center and the hospital, right, a hospital bragging rights to bring more patients in. But I think, above all, Greenberg felt it was the right thing to do. Oh, and by the way, Kern has a commitment of $2 million in her back pocket. So with the offer of the burn money, says Joe O'Donnell, the hospital got religion. So a door had been opened. It led through the cancer center into the hospital. In late 1997, palliative care advocates walked through it and got to work. So last problem, a cultural problem. How does a countercultural program like this avoid being siloed in the basement of the hospital after it gets started? You know, another fragment of a highly fragmented uh, specialized bureaucracy. Let me put the problem of culture in very concrete terms as the people in palliative care saw it. The palliative care team is a consultative team. It doesn't have its own patients, unless they're referred by other docs. But docs who won't even use the D word with their patients weren't eager to refer. So now we've come to our fourth strategy of change. You've got to change the culture. How did the new team chip away at the culture? Data, evidence, research, yes. But evidence-based medicine would only take them so far in a culture of cure where patient death is considered doctor failure, where docs feared undermining the hope of their patients. But what's interesting here is the kind of project that Bakaitis and her colleagues set up, the kind of research design. The project was actually designed to win adherence amongst the other doctors, not simply because of the data, but because the team had the foresight to appeal to some concrete interests of the skeptical doctors and also the skill to woo their hearts and minds. It was called Project Enable, and here's how it worked. Fundamental to the design was that when patients walked through the door and were first diagnosed with cancer, they, on their return visit, would not only see the oncologist, but would see someone from the palliative care team. They would be offered, and most accepted this offer, uh, a four-seminar course which would teach them the basic skills of decision-making, introduce them to the difficult choices about how to manage symptoms and stress. It was a course that Marie Kern designed. A nurse coordinator then coached them in navigating the system from the beginning to the end. The doctors and nurses on the team helped manage symptoms and pain and provided counseling. The hope was that treatments would bring remission, but when it came time to make tough decisions, they could get guidance from trusted nurses and doctors who'd been supporting them for months. And the team got funding for the Enable project from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation because the failure of the support project led it to create a new project to bankroll new experiments in palliative care. And it put that project under the direction of a very skilled uh, and very persuasive palliative care physician named Dr. Ira Bayak. So how did they resolve the referral problem? 
Well, the Enable project gave the docs an extra incentive to refer their patients. Dartmouth was what is known as a designated cancer research center. That meant it got huge grants every five years from the National Cancer Institute, but it could only get those grants if it could prove that it was actively doing research. And one of the measures of proof were the number of patients in research trials. The Enable project was now offering to enroll dozens, hundreds, into research trials. And referring doctors would get credits from the cancer center, and that would help get the grants. So the cancer center agreed to an automatic referral system. When patients in designated areas were first diagnosed, they were automatically referred to palliative care and then offered a place in the trial. It's not that the doctors didn't care about the subject of the research, said Marie Bakaitis, but their interests were not always our interests. That was what we failed to understand at Dartmouth in the beginning. That's why we were naively submitting these failed proposals. We wanted people to do the right thing because it was the right thing. But, in her words, what keeps the CEOs up at night is not that someone is dying miserably, but that there aren't enough beds or there aren't enough people in trials. So the prestige of getting a research grant helps. It enrolls the patients. No one, no one is going to turn down money. No organization in its right mind. So it's so great that it happens also to be the right thing to do. Now, getting the patient referrals gave the team a second way to challenge the culture. As consultants, they began to work side by side with the oncologists. How to deal with pain, how to talk to patients. They could model that for the oncologists. How to do end of life caring. In fact, the palliative care doctors consciously sought to woo their colleagues. The attitude on the team wasn't, let us show you why our methods are better, but rather, let us help make your work easier. We'll help with pain management. We'll help with decision support. So the whole way the palliative care was structured was not only medically sound, but was politically astute and socially sensitive. And slowly, it was slow, they began to chip away at the culture to show the other docs that there didn't need to be a clash of cultures. The program began to grow. The actual details are really interesting, but I'll save that growing up story for another time. A few milestones, the number of full-time docs in the service expanded from one in 2001 to two in 2003 when the hospital hired Ira Bayak as its director of palliative care. Today, there are now over six full-time doctors. They added more nurses, a chaplain, two social workers, a massage therapist, a large team of volunteers. In 2010, they put into uh, action a plan to expand their work, most from, which was centered mostly on cancer patients, uh, to patients with chronic or terminal illnesses in the ICU and in the hospital medicine department. And just this last March, the hospital was gifted $10 million, the largest gift in its history, to create an in-hospital hospice and palliative care facility for what the hospital calls whole person care and whole person end of life care. So there's a lot more, but I'll save that for another time. Let me conclude. If we're really interested in designing care when there is no cure, palliative care itself just avoids the very tip of the iceberg. And many of us in this room, me included, are on the Titanic about to slam into that iceberg. We're more likely, because of the work many of you do in this room, we're actually more likely to live longer than any previous generations. That means we're more likely to suffer from progressive chronic illnesses, to become frail, to have difficulties caring for ourselves. Activists, like Dr. Joanna Lin, who's now at the Altarum Institute, are urging us to start now to redesign our institutions so that we can age in place gracefully at home or in a decent elder care facility so that we can get help breathing, but also get help opening a can of soup, so that we can manage our pain, but also manage to get rides to the grocery store, to the doctor, to the community center.
There are already prototypes of these programs. In fact, you've got a small one in Denver called uh, Innovage. It's not beyond our reach to design such institutions any more than it was to create hospice or to create palliative care in our hospitals. These innovations were the results of imagination, of research, of public education. They were enabled by far-seeing leadership at major foundations, but they would not have happened without the wise and dedicated institutional designers, people who stepped outside the narrow confines of their professional work to change the organization of their workplaces. People who could find the possibilities hidden in a seemingly closed system. These people weren't saints, they weren't sages. They were citizen stateswomen and statesmen. They were people actually, like most of you, sitting in this room. Thank you. So we'll, we'll take two questions, because we're running uh, out of time here. So we'll have uh, one there. And the second one will be in the middle. So Ken, thank you very much for that very powerful story. So as a continuation of our conversation at dinner last night, I wonder how you would think about this and your magnificent work on practical wisdom that you've done. I actually, what generated my interest in this program was actually earlier work that I've done on practical wisdom and the, the, the problem that I was thinking about a lot was how it is that good judgment, practical wisdom, uh, doing the right thing in the right way in a particular context, how that actually gets undermined by the rules and incentives of our major institutions, whether it's uh, scripted teaching to test not only destroys students, but undermines the judgment of teachers or some of the aspects of the healthcare system. And when I heard about the palliative care program, the thing that first interested me in it, besides the fact of my age and that I'm kind of interested in those issues, the thing that interested in me is this program is just, it's like the epitome of practical wisdom inside a hospital. It's context related, it's, it's, it's care. If you think of the things that Ted told us about the placebo, effects right, of simply holding someone's hand and having a conversation with them and actually caring for them. That's what a placebo effect, but it, it got, it raised the numbers of adequate uh, results to 62%. So here you've got this kind of care which depends on knowing each patient and their context and developing trust and figuring out how to readjust and recalibrate what you're going to do, not only technically, but what to say and how to say it and deal with their family. It was practical wisdom on steroids. So my puzzle was, if I'm interested in how you create institutions that encourage practical wisdom and not just study all the ways it's destroyed, if I could do a history of this program, it would give me some clues about how you could go into maybe it's just said too strongly, into the belly of the beast, into a highly modern, bureaucratized, specialized, fragmented hospital, and actually create a program that encouraged the doctors and the nurses and the massage therapists and the uh, chaplains and the social workers to work together as a team, which takes an extraordinary amount of wisdom and judgment, and to continually give this kind of compassionate care and to get the evidence that it worked. So I wanted to do a case study that showed that was possible. That was how it was connected. I'm struck by, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Welcome. Um, really powerful. I'm struck by the, uh, anti the counterculture uh, development of this program that came in my uh, thinking about this on top of the AIDS ep epidemic where the medical community failed the, the folks that were dying from AIDS, and there was a huge uh, public, uh, well, cultural response to that in caring for those folks outside of the um, current medical establishment and how that might have impacted and empowered people to um, look at the whole person and to take that 
dying phenomena into our life systems and our medical you systems. Know, I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't mention that. I haven't, I thought about it, I haven't studied the connection, but that comes at exactly the time when hospice is also being introduced to in the United States starting late 1970s, right? It comes over from England and it begins to grow and it's exactly the time when the care for AIDS patients demands, it, it, the care for AIDS patients for many years was really palliative care, outside the hospital system, right? In that sense, it was like hospice. It wasn't that necessarily it was outsourced, it's the hospitals wouldn't deal with it, right? So, um, so uh, I think that's an ext another extraordinary example of exactly the, the not the, just the creation of the care, but the training of the people and the doctors, and the, and the luring of doctors in, right, for bringing them in and the convincing them to do this and teaching, totally countercultural, right? And then the countercultural begins to move into the system, not just because of the medical changes, but because of the political changes and the demographic changes, which we're now seeing the results of much more clearly than we did even inside the 1980s. But I think that's another powerful example of um, change that involves research, technique, money, but at its heart were community organizers, were people who said, we're not gonna depend on the establishment, we're gonna do it ourselves, we're gonna organize it ourselves, we're gonna make this happen. And what they made happen then grew, and they made themselves heard, and that also empowered them by doing it. So, we're out of time. Great, thanks okay. very much for empowering us.